Hey all, this is Mike Wilk. I'm currently a fourth year medical student at Loyola Chicago Stretch School of Medicine, and I'm the AAEM RSA Medical Student Council President. This episode will be the first in a series of podcasts just directed towards medical students, just anyone interested in considering or interested in pursuing the field of emergency medicine as a career. So this first episode will be how to shine on your EM clerkships. So if you aren't a member of AAEM RSA, that's the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident Student Association, I'd really consider joining. We have a lot of really great resources, a lot of really great regional and a national conference um, to hopefully get you to your residency of your choice. So we're really fortunate. We have some really great people with us on this podcast today. The first of which is Dr. Epter. He's the program director at Maricopa Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona. So thanks for joining us today, Dr. Epter. Hi, how are you doing? It's great to be here. Good, thanks. And then we also have Dr. Gottlieb, who's actually chief resident at Cook County uh, Stroger Hospital right here in Chicago. So it's really fantastic that we'll have a program director and also a resident so we can really get both perspectives on how to really shine and do your best on your clerkship. So thanks for joining us, Dr. Gottlieb, as well. Great to be here. Thanks for having us, Mike. All right. So actually right now, I'm like currently in the midst of my away rotations doing my emergency medicine clerkships. Um, so I'll really be listening closely to everything you have to say today. There really hasn't been a shift yet that I've walked away from where I feel like I didn't learn anything. And, you know, I often find myself looking back and thinking, you know, I could have presented that patient better. Or I should have like considered that in my differential diagnosis, or I should have looked for that physical exam finding. So today we'll have some really great advice from both Dr. Gottlieb and Dr. Epter on how to do your best to shine on your clerkship. So we'll go ahead and get started. So my, my first question for you both is, you know, what does it take for a student to stand out on your rotation, aka what do you consider an honor student? So Dr. Gottlieb, you want to start out? Sure. Um, so there's a few things. First and foremost, just being hardworking, have a good work ethic, you know, willingness to kind of pick up patients and help out in the department. Specifically, we like team players in the ER. The ER is always a team, so offering to help out, the willingness to you know sign up for that dizziness, left leg pain for a year, intermittent blurry vision patient that no one really wants. As long as the resident are telling you okay with that, we, we notice that we appreciate that part of it. Um, a big thing is teachability. So I don't really care as much how much you know coming in because you're not expected to know everything and you're gonna learn a lot more in residency. But that desire to learn more, the ability to you know, incorporate suggestions and changes, that's huge and that's gonna carry you so far in life, so much more than whatever, you know, random pieces of knowledge we can learn in medical school that we will apply that day. And then finally, you know, I look for you guys to push yourselves beyond an M4 level. And medical students were oftentimes reporters and of information, but once you go beyond that into residency, you're expected to actually commit to diagnosis. So I like the idea of when you will commit to a diagnosis and a plan, even if it's wrong. You know, it's so much more and come up as a much stronger student, even if the plan isn't right, that you committed to that plan, you thought it through, you made a logical plan out of it. Last thing really is just, again, kind of going with that, pushing yourself beyond going above an M4 level was, I remember I had one fourth year medical student I was working with and there was a third year medical student as well. And while I was busy taking care of a resuscitation patient, I kind of came back and he was teaching the third year how to work on our presentations, how to make them more succinct and improved. And that really stood out to me as going above and beyond. All right, great, thanks. And Dr. Epter, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so uh, Mike brought up some uh, wonderful points um, to kind of dovetail on him. You know, one of the things is, you know, you always want to be positive on the rotation. And I think one of the pitfalls that sometimes students get into is that they get a little bit overzealous uh, in terms of, you know, realizing that, you know, this is kind of a critical rotation for them. It may be uh, an audition rotation that they're really looking to get into that program later, and they obviously want to put their best foot forward. Um, and their positivity sometimes can come off as a little too much. So what I really you know, advise students is be yourself, uh, because that's what has gotten you so far in your life to begin with, um, among self-discipline and, and all the accomplishments that you've had thus far. And there's no need to kind of go over the top, uh, if you will. To dovetail on Mike as well, work ethic is something to me that can't be taught. If you bring enthusiasm, work ethic, and excitement, that's nearly 75% of the scenario. 
uh, that will allow you to shine on a rotation. Because from a medical knowledge standpoint, don't feel you always have to know everything. And it's totally okay that when we ask you a question, uh, if you don't know the answer, simply, I'm really not sure. And that's a wonderful learning opportunity for a student when they aren't sure and they get to go resource something. But the key is to make sure you come back with the answer. You never want to make that same mistake, if you will, twice or be caught off guard on turnover rounds when the attending might be like, oh, so, um, John, what did you think about uh, what I asked you to look up? And then you hadn't looked it up yet. And that kind of, you know, could certainly be a pitfall. But don't feel the pressure of needing to know everything because the way that I look at it is that medical knowledge I can teach you until the cows come home, but I can not teach you work ethic. So it's so critical that you're really looking to pick up charts, to really relish in the experience, and that you have what I would deem this uh, insatiable curiosity to learn and do it with a humble attitude. I think one of the goals of any rotation that I always try to impress upon students is if you learn one thing per day for every day that you're here and do it with a humble attitude, I think you're a rock star student. And really that can translate into residency. I tell my residents to do the same exact philosophy of one thing per day, do it with a humble attitude. And over time, remember that your learning is not a sprint. Emergency medicine, I'm still learning today after 15 or so years of practice. So you really have to try to say, you know, how can I learn a couple of core tools over the next four weeks in rotation that if you really think about it, uh, should, you should think in terms of scaffolding your education such that let me build the right infrastructure now on my sub I, and then I'll just keep adding additional levels over my career. Uh, so there's ways to shine, um, and to me, that's what great that is having excitement, this curiosity uh, that's really insatiable and somewhat palpable of just teach me, and then kind of avoiding some of those uh, early pitfalls that I brought up. Okay, all right, great. That's all great advice. And so kind of moving from, you know, what can make a student stand out We'll ask Dr. Gottlieb, what are some common mistakes or, you know, red flags that you see students making that, you know, they should hopefully never make again? I think Dr. Ector did a great job touching on a lot of these. And so kind of building off that and adding a few as well. One of them is uh, not knowing your limits. So as a medical student, I, as I mentioned, I like that you guys push yourself a little beyond, but not to the point where it's going to potentially compromise patient care, things that, such as like signing up for two or three patients at a time or overcommitting that could be an, be an issue every once in a while or else um, you know, trying to perhaps perform a procedure without discussing it first. Small laceration repairs or INDs, um, you need to know about that before it's happening. Um, those are big ones. The, sm the, other one, the other one that kind of comes up is um, response to feedback. So all of us make, are gonna make mistakes. That's okay, we're human. And so oftentimes, you know, if I'm giving feedback on how to do something differently, it's because I want to make you a better doctor because I want you to learn some mistakes that I've personally made or seen. And so, you know, not listening or becoming very defensive um, or, you know, as Dr. Epson mentioned as well, making the same mistake again on the exact next patient um, can, can be concerning. Um, the only other thing really is um, just remember that ER is a team and be nice to everyone, you know, the staff, the patients, everyone. I mean, it would, we're all a big family, and um, it's definitely noticed if you're, uh, if you're you know, disrespectful or not nice to them. Okay. All right, great. And anything to add to that, Dr. Upper? Yeah, so, uh, again, great points brought up by Mike. The um, things that I would talk about is, you know, the residents are the key, right, uh, in a lot of different respects to kind of pushing you forth in your rotation. Um, not only because uh, in a lot of cases they're going to be your principal teacher that is going to hear some of your cases uh, possibly before you present to the attending. So, but there's probably going to be a lot of behavior that you're going to emulate that you see in particular residents who you consider strong on your rotation. And it's like, wow, you know, 
they're really bright, they work hard, etc. I, I kind of want to be like that resident uh, with your obviously your own personal twist on that. And so thus, make sure that you befriend all of the residents because who is going to give me you know, immediate feedback on whether you're a star or not is them. Uh, it even happened yesterday uh, when we had a bunch of new students uh, come for the rotation and immediately there was some feedback uh, to the positive about, wow, I, you know, I really enjoy working with him. So keep an eye on that person, right? So it's very important to make sure that obviously you get along with the residents. And as Mike brought up, nurses are so critical to our survival. Um, they're really the backbone of the emergency department. So as a student, make sure you introduce yourself to the nurse who's taking care of the patient that you're going to see. A, so that they know who you are and then can really have you know, somewhat of a relationship with you during the encounter with the patient so that they'll go to you with information or with questions about patient management. You know, one of the things that I always hear attendings comment on, or even, you know, it boils down to residents, sometimes nurses, is that there's a lack of ownership of the patient from a student perspective. So in some places, you'll be able to chart. In other places, you may just have to, you know, pull out a standard piece of paper and write down your history and physical and your assessment and plan. But whatever means and ways that the system is set up, you have to own the patient. If you pull that chart, it's yours. Know the patient inside and out. When results come back, know them before the resident or the attending says, hey, John, you know, what was the chest x-ray finding? And you're like, well, it showed a possible pneumonia, you know, but I'd love to go over it with you. Again, there's that insatiable curiosity and, you know, more about learning, but not the opposite of, oh, I don't know what the results are. But yet for the past hour, the chest x-ray has been ready and the patient had pneumonia. You didn't start antibiotics early enough, et cetera. And it's kind of this, you know, bad do domino effect. So lack of ownership of patients, I think, is a major pitfall um, for any student on a rotation because, you know, let's face the truth. You're only probably going to carry two or three patients simultaneously at a time. So it's not that your caseload is so big. So that's why it's so critically important to know them in and out. So I really kind of pay close attention to who your staff is, befriend them, introduce yourselves, especially at this time of the year when it's sometimes difficult for staff to determine who are the new residents, the new interns who just started, versus you being in the emergency department as well. So it's uh, kind of a that portion of the year that dictates, you know, kind of going the extra mile. All right, great, thank you. And so my next question would be, what kind of tips do you have for presented patients? Because I think this is kind of one of the hardest things right now is you, you're always presented to a new attending, you know, some like very thorough presentations, some like very concise presentations. And so we'll go ahead and start with Dr. Gottlieb. Do you have any tips for how students can best present their patients? Sure. So. In general, you want to be concise. Um, our attention spans are pretty short in emergency medicine, and you want to try to keep our interest throughout the presentation. So as a general format for an, ER presenta for an ED presentation, it should be a one-line HPI with a relevant past medical included, followed by a brief story. You can include the relevant family and social history here, but you don't have to talk about additional information if it's not relevant. For example, if you're telling me about a 22-year-old male who rolled his ankle, really don't need to know about a maternal history of breast cancer, probably not very relevant to this, but that doesn't mean it's not important to get all this inf information that you're going to put in your chart or get in the bigger picture of the patient. You go on, From there, you're going to talk about physical exam, and that should generally include vital signs, a general appearance, and then the area of interest. So again, you should be completing full physical exams on these patients, but you really only need to present the areas of relevance. So one way to say this for a hypothetically 22-year-old gentleman would be his vitals were within normal limits. On exam, he's well appearing and resting comfortably. His overall exam is unremarkable with the exception of tenderness to palpation along the left lateral malleolus with a small effusion. No palpable bony abnormalities, no open wounds. He has good range of motion, five out of five strength, sensations in tactile light touch. DP and PT pulses are two plus and cap refills less than two seconds. 
So, you know, if I want to know more about this patient, I can ask about the different aspects of the exam, but really don't know, need to know about HENT, uh, head, ears, eyes, nose, throat, or this cardiac exam for the patient coming with left with uh, ankle pain. And then once you're done with your history and physical, give me a differential and commit to that top diagnosis. So generally, I'd like to know you consider the life threats and address either why you're concerned about them or why you're not concerned about them and how you rule them out. For example, if you're presenting a chest pain patient, I want to know you considered acute coronary syndrome, PE, dissection, pneumothorax, and esophageal rupture. And in the end, every person is a little bit different with regard to what they expect from presentations. And my best recommendation from this would be just to talk with the person after the presentation and say, what would, what would be better for presenting to you? You know, how would I best tailor this presentation? And then you can kind of start to tailor it to each attending and senior resident because everyone's a little different in what they expect. All right, great. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Epper, can we get the attending perspective on how, to, how a student should present? Sure. So um, to echo some of the comments, uh, one of the things is that I always try to tell students in their orientation is depending upon who you're working with that day, introduce yourself, which is key, and ask them, you know, how do you best like me to present the case? Because they may look for, you know, each attending has their own, you know, kind of, if you will, wheelhouse. You know, maybe, you know, they're great at teaching physical exam related stuff, so they want a little bit more information there, or others are great at kind of teasing out historical points. So just simply ask, um, you know, what do you expect out of my presentation? And then definitely get the, if you will, the lowdown or the skinny uh, from the residents as kind of a 1A, 1B. And then one of the more common things that I think students have trouble with is they, uh, if you will, they ping pong back and forth between beginning their history. So you know, since we're talking about chest pain patient, you know, this is a 55-year-old male who came in with chest pain. And then all of a sudden, they move off the history and straight into the physical exam. Like, uh, oh, but, you know, his uh, his legs weren't edematous. But um, he doesn't have shortness of breath. And then when I listen to heart and lungs, and literally you see this almost status epilepticus type of presentation occur. <laughs> Um, if not this ping pong effect of just bouncing back and forth and then maybe even into their assessment before a physical exam is even uh, discussed. So to echo uh, the point, clear, concise, but in an order. And, you know, most of the templates that exist these days are very clear cut with chief complaint, HPI, then physical exam, and then, you know, constitutional, general, etc., and then on from there, and it would really kind of stick to that because it prevents, I guess, the attending feeling like, wow, this person is really scattered, you know? Even if you happen to know your stuff, you kind of trip up on H&P. So to look into the differentials, uh, because these tend to be pretty widespread uh, amongst uh, students and even junior residents, uh, I always uh, tell students to if you will, uh, spit the diagnosis, S-P-I-T, uh, which is one, what is the most serious of the possibilities that exist? So I'm going to put up chest pain, so yeah, ACS, P-E, dissection, etc. Then what is the most probable of the differentials based upon this patient's presentation? So if they happen to be young, healthy, you know, obviously maybe just had uh, some exertional related stuff yesterday, they were lifting up a uh, heavy object, then sure, uh, I'm always considering ACS, but the most probable scenario in this patient is just musculoskeletal strain, right? And then I is what's kind of an interesting differential uh, in this patient, and then T, uh, how would I treat, or you know, what is the treatable uh, diagnosis. So the differential diagnosis is what I always tell young learners and even first and sometimes second year residents who may not just have a really good differential. The other thing I would tell you about differential diagnoses, when you feel you're stuck, uh, there's a couple of key points. 
if you really have no clue yet, then you really haven't taken a good history and physical. Uh, and remember, the old adage, 95% of a patient's diagnosis comes off of his or her history and physical, especially history, right? So if you feel yourself kind of like, wow, I'm not, you leave the room, you're like, you know, I'm really not sure what's going on. Then that should be an automatic uh, do an about face, go back in and talk to the patient more because you probably just haven't teased out enough information to give you a real firm feel as to what you should do next. So I call it the additional three questions or the three question rule. As soon as a student or resident comes and sits down, they seem like they're really not clear what's happening. I'm like, go back, ask three more questions and I think it'll be clearer. One of the other things I think that is always helpful, uh, again, just to solidify, because oftentimes um, senior residents and attendings will get a completely different story than what a student does. And it's not because the student is not smart or intuitive or what have you. It's just that we have more experience, right? Especially in emergency medicine, everything is based upon a lot of the volume of the number of patients that you see. So don't feel inadequate, but just kind of wrap up the situation with a patient by saying, you know, listening to everything, but let me just get this clear before I present your case to the attending. You have chest pain, it began yesterday. It doesn't radiate, but it was associated with some shortness of breath. And then the patient has the chance to kind of auto correct as you're going, no, 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 I don't have any shortness of breath. Okay, great. So then that makes it a little bit cleaner when you come to the attending and more likely that we're going to get the same story. So remember three questions, repeat the case uh, with the patient. And then the last thing is with differentials, in addition to spit, you should think about forming differentials by organ systems first, and then listing the diagnosis under the organ system. So for example, if I come in with, I think we brought up before, right ankle pain, and I give you nothing else. I just say 24-year-old male presents with right ankle pain or right lower extremity pain. Sure, the first thing that you think about is musculoskeletal. Um, and you'll say, well, you know, is the ankle broke? Did they sprain it, etc." But think first in terms of what organ systems can affect the right lower extremity. So yes, could be musculoskeletal, could be skin, right? A cellulitis, abscess uh, type of scenario. Um, well, if it's right lower extremity pain, uh, maybe they have swelling. So maybe it's a vascular issue or they have renal problems and thus they have lower extremity edema. So, and then maybe it's vascular, meaning peripheral vascular disease, or they have arterial occlusion. So, there's many more differentials that exist if you just say what organ systems can affect this patient and then go and list your differentials under the organ systems. Try it at home. You'll go from probably 10 differentials on one complaint to maybe at least 25 if you do it this way. And not that we need 25, but it really kind of uh, shows kind of a good depth and breadth the bigger the differentials that you can make on a patient um, because that means you're being inclusive rather than tunnel vision only. That's some of the thoughts I have. All right, great. That's all great advice. And so my last question um, is just what kind of questions or information would you recommend students ask uh, to the faculty and residents when they're actually on their clerkships just to learn more about the residency programs? And we'll go ahead and start with Dr. Gottlieb. Sure. Um, so I think one of the most important questions for me was just why you, why they chose that program. Because you get a lot of insight into the program and to their personality and the personality of the other residents. And I think that's probably one of my favorite questions to ask. Um, after that, you know, what similar things, what's your favorite thing about this program? And delicately phrased, what's your least favorite thing or something that you'd like to have, you know, that you wish to change? It's good to get a sense of the social environment too, because you're going to have these people for the next couple of years as your co-residents and friends and sort of family in a sense. And so, you know, you want to know how often they go out after, how often did your, you and your class go out together after work? What do you guys like to do? 
And then if you're not from the area, you want to ask, I think it's helpful to know about the city because you might be spending the next three to four years at this place. And you should know, you know, what's the vibe of the city, what's going on here. Um, you know, is this family oriented? If you have a family, is this, is the residency family oriented or not as well? So these are pretty helpful things to know about more of the social aspects as well. All right, great, thank you. And Dr. After anything to add? Yeah, so great points. I'll tell you that in any four week rotation, nothing can be hidden. So it's, you know, things will come out in terms of really perceiving how happy residents are within that respective program. And then if there's any other, if you will, side issues. And that's why you're there. It's a audition. Uh, as Mike brought up, obviously you wanna go through and, and, and do your due diligence about asking, you know, what are you most excited about here? One of the other things that I would ensure that you do is really immerse yourself, like go out with them, do all the things that the residents are doing. I'm sure uh, the more collegial they are and family re, you know, oriented they are, they'll invite you to different events that occur or, hey, you know, like, would you like to go biking, hiking, whatever kind of is the flavor, depending upon where the residency is located and do those things because then you're with a collection of the group. So certainly you'll see the resident who's tremendously happy with the program, has only good things to say and honestly feels that way. And then you'll see kind of that person who's right in the middle. They are happy with the program, but then they'll give you the real skinny, you know? Um, well, I wish this was different. Uh, or, um, you know, maybe this rotation would be best if it was not an internal medicine floor rotation, but a critical care rotation. And those are the people you want to end up seeking out. Um, not, if you will, the happy Smurf and not the grumpy Smurf. You really want the one right in between uh, because they're probably happy with the program overall, but will give you the real skinny. And it's always important to say, you know, if you had the ability to, you know, do this all again, would you choose here? And, you know, inevitably the answer 99% of the time is yes. But I still think it's worth an ask. The other things um, that I would do before we close is definitely befriend the coordinator of the program. I can't tell you how critical that is. That if I go to my coordinator and say, so what did you think of Mary? And she's like, she never talked to me for four weeks. That's a red flag. Uh, because anyone resident-wise will tell you that, you know, the coordinator is essentially the mother hen of the program if they happen to be female. And then, you know, they're the lifeline towards the program director. And they always have the program director's ear, et cetera. So similarly, if it's like, wow, they're always pleasant, you know, they come in, they say hi, they're not too overbearing, et cetera, then it's like, great. You know, that's, uh, there's a huge endorsement factor that comes when the program coordinator thinks you're a rock star. Um, and it, really makes for a very easy path for me. And I think similarly with colleagues. So befriend the coordinator, and obviously don't frustrate the coordinator because that to me is essentially, um, you become asystolic at that point in terms of getting on the rank list. So you wanna avoid that. Um, but really immerse yourself and just enjoy the experience. Um, you have to realize that in this day and age, things are really in your favor to match. Um, it's rare for a student um, not to match if they've done admirably during their EM rotations, uh, you know, getting high passes or honors, and then, you know, didn't really have any hiccups on, you know, national testing. Um, chances are you're gonna match, which is great. Uh, and you may not think things are in your favor now, but if you take a lot of the points, I think, that were learned today uh, and brought up, you, you'll definitely push things in, in, in your favor. So enjoy the experience because it's only going to happen, you know, once, if you will. And realize that, again, this is definitely the marathon, not the sprint. And at the end of the day, you're really most likely to end up where you want to be. And that's being an emergency medicine resident and then physician thereafter. And um, just enjoy that uh, because I, I think you guys work so incredibly hard and are so self-disciplined 
um, but put so much pressure on yourself during these two to three months of sub eyes that you really don't enjoy it as much as you should. So at the end of the process, probably by January, February, when interviews wrap up, etc., just reward yourself uh, because uh, you deserve that at the same time. All right, great. Thank you. But I definitely will do my best to enjoy it. So just real quick, uh, before we wrap up, just want to ask uh, Dr. Gottlieb, can you just tell us a little bit about Cook County? Sure. So as Mike mentioned, I'm one of the chief residents of Cook County, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we're a four-year program centered out of the county hospital, but we have multiple ties to both academic and community hospitals for additional offsite training. Uh, we provide care to a large number of under and uninsured patients who are very grateful for their care and honestly make you feel just so appreciated every day. And also because of the poor follow-up, we also see some very, very sick people and some just incredible pathology, sadly, that are just due to extreme progression of illnesses. Um, we've been actively revamping our curriculum and education with uh, increased focus on teaching shifts and morning reports, as well as more resident research. But most important, importantly, we're just a good group of residents clinically, socially, and we're excited to meet a number of you guys during the upcoming interview season. All right, great. Thank you. And then, Dr. After, can we just hear a little about Maricopa? Sure. Yeah, so uh, we're one of the uh, older programs in the country, uh, beginning in the 1980s. Um, so there's a lot of, if you will, rich history uh, that uh, exists at Maricopa. Uh, similar to county, uh, you know, we are also a county facility, um, which, you know, essentially is your safety net hospital of the, uh, of the community um, that has a lot of underserved and uh, patients, obviously, who do not have insurance as well. And I think, you know, if you, if you really enjoy the county atmosphere of, you know, being that first line as a result of the fact that uh, many of those patients don't have primary care, as Mike said, and come in with more advanced disease, you know, that's what most county hospitals are, and they truly are that safety net. We happen to stretch out to a lot of, we have five other hospitals that residents rotate at uh, for community uh, emergency medicine, as well as Phoenix Children's Hospital, which is one of the largest children's hospitals in the country, and some other experiences to augment your education. So um, really, wherever you choose, I think you'll have a, a wonderful experience amongst all the EM programs that are out there, but really kind of you know tailor it to what kind of patient population do I want to serve um, when you're making some initial choices. For residency, a lot will just come down to location, location, location for many of students. But the key is who do I want to serve? And different programs are set up different ways. But uh, I think between the two of our hospitals, with the one exception of Count Cook being four years and us being three years, the patient populations we serve are really mirroring one another. And you have to see if that's, that's of interest to you. All right, great, thank you. So that uh, that concludes our first episode, How to Shine on Your EM Clerkship. Dr. Rupter and Dr. Gottlieb, thank you so much for joining me on the call today. And to all the students out there listening, hope you enjoyed this session. Have a good one. Thank you.